Origami Written by Paul Stewart When he applied for the teaching job in Colombo, John knew that the school was offering only a local wage. They gave him accommodation, though, and he had hoped the money would be enough for him to live on. So long as he did nothing in the evenings and weekends, it was enough, but John had not traveled to Sri Lanka to spend all his free time locked up in the tiny flat. When he first arrived, he visited some of the island's places of interest, the ancient ruins of Anuradhapura, the candy parade with its painted elephants and fire eaters, the tea plantations of Nura Elia. Now he wanted more. There was, however, a problem. To see everything he wanted, he needed to earn more money lots more. Zoe, who also worked at the school, told him the going rate for private lessons was 1,000 rupees an hour. It seemed a crazy amount, but then John knew that most of the Japanese and Europeans working in the country and up to 50 times as much as he did. As Zoe put it, for them, the 1,000 rupees was a bargain. For John Merson it was a month's salary. He placed an advertisement in the Daily Observer, and six days later received a reply from a Japanese couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Soto. He phoned their number at once, discovered that they wanted conversation lessons one a week for ten weeks, and fixed a time for the lessons to take place. Things were going well. Then John spoke about the money. Mr. Soto did not reply. Instead, John heard a sharp intake of breath. That's for the two of you. He explained. He was beginning to think that Zoe had got it all wrong. One thousand per session. For a second time, Mr. Soto seemed to gasp. Is. Is that okay? John asked. Is okay. Came the abrupt reply. John shook his head sadly as he put down the phone. Mr. Soto obviously thought the lessons were too expensive but was too polite to say. John didn't think the couple would turn up. It was therefore a surprise when, at seven o'clock on the dot, there was a soft knock at the door. John ran to open it. Mr. and Mrs. Soto. He said. Do come in. That first lesson was difficult. Although they both got high marks in their written tests, Yajima and Yuko Soto found speaking extremely difficult. John knew that a large part of his work would be to build up their confidence. Where did you first learn English? He asked. Ah, ah. Mr. Soto began. I, I, I learned English, I learned in the school. At school. John said, encouragingly. But Mr. Soto had noticed the correction. Yajima, Yajima. He growled. Then, all of a sudden, he began beating his forehead with the palm of his hand. Mrs. Soto stared down at the table. At the school, at the school, at the school. Mr. Soto repeated, over and over again. John watched in horror. He decided to make a note of any errors so that they could look at them together more carefully and less painfully later in the lesson. At eight o'clock, John sat back in his chair. The Sotos closed their exercise books and waited. Excellent, said John, getting up. The Sotos picked up their books and stood behind their chairs. John handed them both some homework and asked them to prepare a talk for the next lesson. About a Japanese saying. He explained. A saying which will help me understand Japan. Mr. Soto nodded. Is okay. He said. As he closed the door behind them, John remembered the money. Never mind. He thought. It can wait. Back in his room he saw that the Sotos had left him something after all. There on the table stood a crane made from a single sheet of blue paper. John placed it on the window sill and thought no more about it. The second lesson went much better. The Sotos again arrived at exactly seven o'clock. 
There were no mistakes in their homework, and they were both obviously eager to start talking. We, ah, have chosen, ah, following the saying. Mr. Soto announced. Nail that stands up with hammered down. Mrs. Soto smiled and nodded. Which means, Japanese person must not be different, must, ah, must. Confirm. Said Mr. Soto, smiling and nodding. Conform. Said John, and immediately regretted it. Conform, conform, conform. Mr. Soto repeated, beating his forehead over and over. Suddenly he stopped and looked up. Conform. He said, and smiled. As they talked, John noticed that Mr. and Mrs. Soto never once looked at each other. Their attention was fixed on him, their teacher. When he told them how well they were speaking, they both looked down at the table and blushed. Again, the matter of money did not come up. Again, John returned to the sitting room to find a small origami animal standing on the table. This time, it was a yellow horse. He picked it up and turned it over in his hand. Every fold had been done so carefully. It must have taken ages to make. Puzzled, John shook his head. I suppose they'll pay the whole lot at the end of the ten weeks. He placed the horse next to the crane. The third lesson was actually fun. John had asked the Sotos to prepare a Japanese joke, and for the first time, both of them seemed at their ease. They spoke more fluently than before, and Mr. Soto managed not to hit himself even once. This joke, he explained. Is one of many who are to do with grandma jokes. I don't like them. Mrs. Soto interrupted, staring ahead. But to many do, said Mr. Soto. He cleared his throat. If you've a grandma with a sweet tooth, then spread honey all over your a crackery when she has finished drinking it all off. The crackery will shine like new. John grinned. He liked black humor, and he enjoyed the discussion they had about the problems of an aging population. A dragon joined the horse and crane on the window sill. So it went on. Every week, the Sotos would come for their lesson. Every week, John would find a new origami figure to add to his collection. At the end of the seventh lesson, however, things were a little different. Mr. Soto cleared his throat, bowed and held out a present. Happy birthday, he said, looking down. And many happy returns, said Mrs. Soto. John smiled awkwardly. He found himself bowing. Thank you, he said. But how did you know? Mrs. Soto smiled. You mentioned it in ah lesson four, said Mr. Soto. You are an Aquarius, Mrs. Soto added. Oh yes, said John. They were right. Somehow that evening, the discussion had turned to fortune telling. Mrs. Soto had confessed to using the I Ching. Mr. Soto, John remembered. Had said hardly anything at all. Later, when they had gone, John looked at the present. The wrapping alone was a work of art. The expensive paper had been neatly folded, tied up with ribbons, and decorated with bows. It seemed a shame to open it. John didn't like to think of himself as greedy, but he started to imagine what could be inside the wonderfully wrapped gift. A personal stereo, perhaps, or a miniature television, something Japanese. Beneath the paper was a small wooden box. John placed it on the table and removed the lid. Inside were six pairs of ornately decorated chopsticks. John smiled. Something Japanese, he said. With the final lesson over, John knew he would miss his weekly lessons with the Sotos. They, it seemed, felt the same. We Japanese are an insular people, Mrs. Soto said. 
。サーベイズショーザットウィーハブリトルインタレストイン、ミキシングウィズフォーリナーズ。Mr. Soto explained. It is shame, a shame. He laughed. You are a good teacher, Mr. Marshin, said Mrs. Soto. It has been our pleasure to study with you. Mr. Soto added, and with a bow, he handed John his card. Please do, stay in touch. He said. As they left, Mrs. Soto slipped something into John's hand. Thank you, she said, and lowered her head. Thank you. John shut the door, and looked down. He was holding yet another folded piece of paper. This time, it was a square wallet, which had some banknotes inside. John counted them quickly. But there's only five thousand. He said. It should be ten. He felt angry. Why had they cheated him? Why? They were friendly, they gave him their address. Didn't they think he would write to ask for the rest? It made no sense. And then he noticed them, the row of origami figures on the window ledge. What was it Mrs. Soto had once said? We Japanese do not like to show money. He picked up the blue crane and carefully unfolded it. Inside were two rolled 500 rupee notes. There was more inside both the yellow horse and red dragon. The white swan he had received in the fourth week was different though. It contained 2000 rupees, and so did all the remaining figures. Altogether, the Sotos had paid him 20,000 rupees for their lessons. That made 1000 an hour, each the going rate. John smiled. Zoe had been right after all. Now he could explore every inch of the island.